Hi, and welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith, and in this video, we're going to learn the two to four player game, Blood Orders, designed by Nick Badaliaka and published by Trick or Treat Studios, who helped sponsor this video. As outcast vampires, you and the other players are looking to rise to power in a new, unsuspecting city that's ripe for the taking. But only one vampire can rule. So join me at the table, and let's learn how to play. To set up, put the game board in the center of the play area, and beside the board, put these blood, influence, and victory tokens, which I've set into some game trays I have. And if you'd like some of your own, you'll find links in the description below. Now find the Bleeder and Elder decks. You can distinguish these by the titles in their centers here. And although the artwork will be different for the sake of variety, the cards within each deck are actually identical. So the two decks do not need to be shuffled. The Bleeder deck is then set here with the Elders beside them. Now find the Ritual cards, which have this back, and sort them into three decks by what is known as their Act values, shown in the bottom right-hand corner. You'll have an Act 1, Act 2, and Act 3 deck. Shuffle each of them separately, putting the Act 2 and Act 3 decks away from the play area for now, but put the Act 1 deck face down beside the board. And from it, you'll deal four rituals face up into the spaces for them at the top of the board by this area known as the Altar. Now find the location cards, which have this back, and also sort and shuffle them into three decks by the Act symbols in their corners. Set the Acts 2 and 3 decks aside for now, but then deal an Act 1 location face up into each of the spaces of this column, leaving the bottom one blank if you have less than four players. In this video, we'll assume we have two players. Then all remaining Act 1 locations you have in the deck are returned to the box. These won't be used in this game. Now find the victim cards, which are the remaining ones that share the same backs as the bleeder and elder cards. But victims have different names in their center and are also divided into Act 1, 2, and 3 decks, which you'll shuffle separately. Again, we set the Act 2 and 3 decks aside for use later, dealing one face up from the Act 1 deck into each space of this column. Again, leaving the final space empty if we have less than four players. The remaining Act 1 victim cards you'll set as a deck nearby. Now in this column, add a total value of three blood tokens to each space, except, again, the bottom one, unless you have four players. Next, look at the influence value of each victim, which is found by this green swirly symbol here, and then add that value in influence tokens to the space beside it, along with the blood tokens. Now take a look at each row separately, and within a row, add together any of these cross symbols you find in the card's upper right-hand corners. Then take one of these fear-tracking dice and set it to that value, placing the die into the space here of that row. You do this for each of the rows, adding a die to the related space set to the correct value of crosses for that row. Next, find this Day Act tracking marker and set it on the bottommost space of this track of the board here. Now have each player choose a color and collect the matching colored player screen. Behind it, they'll set the bat-shaped player board in their color and what are known as their three order tokens. Then beside their screen in full view, they also put a total value of seven blood tokens and five influence taken from the general supply. Each person also gets one of these fear tokens that they set onto the bottom space of what is known as the fear track. Then have each person draw four bleeder and three elder cards to form their opening hand. Finally, the player who most recently drank blood collects this start player marker. Or I suppose you can just pick someone randomly. And that's the setup. In Blood Orders, each person is trying to build their own underground kingdom by sending out vampires and underlings to locations in the city to perform rituals, recruit new members, and collect the one thing that every vampire craves. Victory points. And yes, blood too, but mostly victory points. The game is broken into three acts, and each act is made up of three days. So nine days total makes up a full game. And each of those days is broken into four phases, starting with the planning phase. 
Here, you'll assign your order tokens to the spaces of your player board as a way of planning out what actions you want to resolve in the next phase. And you do all of this behind your screen where no one else can see what you're doing. But to make it easier for me in this video, I'll just remove this screen for now. Each token will show a symbol in the middle which represents one of the three different times of day, dawn, dusk, and night. And this relates to these three columns of the board that show the matching symbols for dawn, dusk, and night. While we're here, also notice that the rows are labeled as the north, south, east, and west quarter. But ignore the west quarter if you have fewer than four players. Now the actions you're planning will often relate to using the cards or tokens found in these spaces. We'll learn all about the various actions in a moment, but let's say for now that I know I want to take the action that this card provides. Notice this is in the dusk column and the south quarter. To set this as one of my planned actions, I would then take my token showing the dusk symbol and add it to the dusk slot of my player board, rotating it so that the south quarter is at the top. The name you rotate to the top is the quarter that you're targeting with this order. Now you'll notice this is the only order token you have with a dusk symbol, so you won't be able to assign another dusk order. But I can still plan something for the dawn and night columns. Now there's another area you can assign orders to, and they're here at the top of the board, and they're known as the altar and catacombs. If you want to take one of those actions, you set any one of your order tokens into the related slots. And these actions don't relate to the quarters, so it doesn't matter how they're rotated. You can even take more than one of each of these actions during the same day by putting more than one token into them. So this would mean I'm planning to do two catacomb actions and one dusk action in the south quarter. So, to summarize, you secretly place your three order tokens as you like around your player board behind your screen in anticipation of the actions you hope to resolve later, which we'll explain soon. But there is one other step you must perform during this phase. When assigning tokens to any of these three slots of your player board, you must also commit cards from your hand to those tokens as well, because those orders that you'll resolve later will have a cost that must be paid. Now, as an example, let me show you the cost related to this dusk order in the south quarter. That's pointing us to this action. This is the card we want to resolve later, and the cost to resolve an order later is shown on the die value of that related row. So two in this case. And that two means we must assign cards showing at least two dusk symbols on them to the related order token because this action is in the dusk column. We have a hand of cards and these will show the dawn, dusk, and night symbols in their corners with values beside them. So to satisfy our dusk order, we assign cards with a total dusk value that equals or exceeds the value on the related die. So if I assign this Elder and Bleeder to the action together, they give me the required two Dusk symbols. The cards you are assigning to the order, you place under the related section of your board like this. So cards I would assign to this order, I would slide under like this. Just keep in mind there are no card costs for tokens assigned to the Altar or Catacombs. Now again, we haven't seen the benefits of the various actions or why you might want to assign orders to certain ones, but we will go over the actions later where they'll make more sense. But that said, once everyone has secretly planned the placement of their order tokens, it's time to move on to the order phase. Here, beginning with the start player, again, that's the person who has this token, and going clockwise around and around the table, each person takes turns placing one of their order tokens from behind their screen face down onto any of the spaces next to the city quarter rows or onto the altar or catacombs space. For example, if during the planning phase I had this token by the south quarter, I could move it face down to that quarter space. As players take turns setting order tokens, if a token is already in a space they want to go to, that's okay, they just set their token on top. And there's no limit to the number of orders that can be in any one space. You can even have more than one of your own in the same space. Now here's a very important detail. When placing orders, you don't have to put them into the space that you had planned on putting them into when you were setting up behind your screen. The planning stage at the start of the day is just meant to help you do some planning to give you a rough idea of what you want to do so you can save some time during this phase. But you can make adjustments. 
You may decide based on what someone else has done that you don't want to put your order where you had planned to. And that's okay, you can set it somewhere else. One thing you cannot change is the cards that you've assigned to a particular order. Any that you've assigned to a specific slot of your player board must stay there no matter where you end up putting the order token. Okay, there's something else I want to point out. During this phase, order tokens you set beside the quarters won't do anything yet. They'll get resolved later. But any token assigned to the altar or catacombs is immediately resolved before the next order is placed. So let's see how these spaces work. After putting a token at the catacombs, take one card of your choice from the top of either the bleeder or elder deck and then add it to your hand. The order token you assigned stays there, but other players, yourself included, can still add orders here afterwards and collect a card. If you instead place an order at the altar, you now immediately pick a single face-up ritual card from one of these four spaces, checking the requirements of that ritual here. The top cost of a ritual will always be some amount of blood which you must return to the general supply. If you ever find yourself short on blood, then once, and only once during each order phase, either before or after placing an order token, you can perform a special scavenge action. To do this, increase your marker on this track any number of spaces and then take one blood for each space you advanced by. If you ever hit the top of this track, you can't perform the scavenge action again until your marker is lowered by another effect. With the blood cost of a ritual paid, you must now reveal a certain number of cards from your hand to satisfy the remaining symbol requirements. This symbol is the minimum number of cards you must reveal from your hand in order to generate the required number of dawn, dusk, or night symbols that are shown below. In this case, we'd have to reveal at least one victim, but can reveal more, in order to generate three night symbols. Now, the important thing is that the victims used to satisfy the requirements of a ritual must come from your hand. Remember, during the planning phase, you may have assigned cards to the order slots of your player board. You cannot use these to satisfy the requirements of the ritual. Also, bleeders and elders from your hand can't be used to complete a ritual. Let me repeat that for emphasis. Elders and bleeders cannot be used to satisfy the requirements of a ritual at the altar space. Now, on the very first day of the game, all you'll have are bleeders and elders, so that means you can't satisfy a ritual until a later day. You'll also find a reminder of this limitation of the bleeder and elder cards printed directly on them. A little later, we'll see how you can get other types of victims in your hand like these, which can be used to satisfy a ritual. So as an example, if I had these, I could reveal them from my hand because together they satisfy the minimum requirements for the number of victims and night symbols that this ritual is looking for. The important thing is that you just reveal these victims to the other players to show that you satisfy the requirements. You don't actually lose them. After revealing them, you put them back in your hand. With the ritual complete, you then take it and put it beside you, keeping it visible to all the players. Any effect it has printed on it here is now available for you to use when appropriate, even on the same turn you collected it, if possible. We won't go through all the various effects printed on the rituals because how they work is printed directly on them, but I will mention that any effect that says it occurs on your turn is referring to your turn during the order phase specifically. And an effect like this can be resolved either before or after placing an order token. And you can resolve as many different ritual effects that you might have like this as you like during your turn. If an effect says it can be used only once per day, then after using it, turn it sideways as a reminder that it can't be used again during this day. Either way, once a ritual has been taken, slide the rest to the right to fill in the gap, and then draw a new one from that axe ritual deck to fill in the empty space. But if this deck ever runs out, a new card is not drawn. I should also mention, it doesn't matter what symbols are on the underside of the order token that's assigned to the catacombs or the altar, and you keep them face down when you put them on those spaces. And they also remain there even after the effect has been resolved. Okay, so to recap, during the order phase, starting with the first player and going clockwise around and around the table, players take turns putting one of their orders onto a space of the board, immediately resolving orders placed on the altar or catacombs, but not ones assigned to the quarters. 
And once all the players have placed all three of their order tokens, it's time to reveal them. Keep in mind, orders assigned to the altar or catacombs will not be revealed, just the ones assigned to the quarters. Starting at the north quarter, reveal the top token if there's more than one in the stack. And when a token is revealed, you look at its symbol and then place it into that related column. So this one goes into the dusk space. Then we reveal the next token down, which goes to dawn. If this had instead shown the dusk symbol, it would be placed on top of the token that's already there. The order of the tokens within a stack is important, as we'll see. Once you've revealed one quarter's order tokens, you reveal the next quarter and so on until they've all been flipped and placed. Then it's time to move to the resolution phase, which starts with the players removing their screens and just setting them off to the side. Now we resolve all of the order tokens, starting at dawn, resolving that column from top to bottom. Then you resolve dusk from top to bottom, and then night, skipping spaces that don't have an order token. If a space has more than one token, resolve them one at a time from top to bottom. Anytime an order token is being resolved, the player who owns it is known as the active player, and the row that it is in is known as the active quarter for any effects that might trigger using those terms. Before resolving a space where you have your token, no matter where it is, always first check to ensure you've overcome your fear. To do this, check the value on the die of the row where your token is resolving, and the symbol type of your order token. You must now show that you have a number of these symbols showing on the cards assigned to the related slot of your player board that are equal to or greater than the die value. So here the die value is 1, and our order token is on the dusk space, so under the dusk area of our player board, we need to have assigned cards showing at least one dusk symbol, and here we actually have two. The die values are set at the beginning of the round, but they can change due to the actions of other players, as we'll see. So when committing cards to your player board, you may want to assign extras just in case the number of symbols you need ends up increasing. Either way, assuming you have enough, all the cards assigned to that order are now set into a stack beside your board known as your torpor pile, and then you resolve the action of the order token. And the actions we'll see in a moment, but just note, as you resolve future actions, you'll continue to add cards from those orders to your torpor pile as well. If the active player does not have enough cards assigned to the action to overcome the die's fear value, they don't get to resolve the action of that token. For example, here, I assign these two cards to this dawn action, and they don't actually generate any dawn symbols. You would never do this, I just did this for the sake of example. But even the cards that you've assigned that are not helping you satisfy the die's fear value, those are now also put into that player's torpor pile. But the order token that you assign to the board will not be resolved. So, to summarize, when resolving an order token, you must first show that you assigned enough cards to create a number of the required symbols that is equal to or greater than the value showing on the die for that row. If you did, then you move those cards to your torpor and get to resolve that order's action space. Now, if you did not assign enough symbols, you still move the cards to torpor, but you don't get to resolve the action, and you move on to the next player. With that understood, let's learn how to resolve the various actions. When your order token is on a card in the Dawn column, resolve the text written on the location card there. For example, the green player here could now either gain three blood or lose one fear. And once the action is complete, the active player takes their token back and then the next player goes. Okay, now let's take a look at resolving the Dusk actions. In this column, we have mortals who will perform actions for you if you persuade them to act by spending the influence tokens shown here. The influence you spend to trigger the effect on these cards must be taken from your personal supply and then added to the night space to that card's right. Now, if I didn't have the influence to spend, nothing happens. But the cards I assigned to that slot of my player board would still go into my torpor pile. We won't go over all the various card effects as how they work is described on them, but I want to talk about this one for just a moment. To resolve this convict's ability, I'd have to spend one influence, and then it would let me choose a city quarter and increase its fear die by two. Increasing this fear die would mean that players who later resolve orders on this row now need to have committed cards with a total value of four symbols 
for their related column instead of just the two that this value was earlier. Otherwise, they can't resolve their order on this row. So as we said earlier, this is why it might be a good idea to commit more cards and symbols to a player board slot than the dice initially show if you're afraid someone might change the die values later. Just keep in mind a die cannot be rotated higher than six or reduced lower than one. Oh, by the way, after you resolve a desk order, whether successfully or not, you then take that order token back. Now let's look at resolving knight actions. To do this, the active player takes the victim card in the active quarter and adds it directly to their hand. Remember I said earlier that elders and bleeders cannot be used to satisfy ritual requirements? Well, these victims that you collect can be used, and they can also be assigned to your player boards when committing cards to actions. That said, once a victim is in your hand, you ignore its special effects here. These effects are only used when the card is on the board and you take an action in its space. With the victim collected, the active player also takes all of the blood and influence tokens in the night space of the active quarter. They also take back their order token itself. Then they increase their marker on the fear track by the value showing on the die of the related quarter. That's how a knight action is resolved if only one order is assigned to that space. But if more than one player has a token in the same knight space, the space is considered contested, and you must check to see who will get to resolve the action, which is different from the other spaces where several players can have orders and each of them will get to take the action. Let's say that more than one order token was in this knight space. Both players here first compare the total value of the knight symbols they committed to this action on that slot of their player board. The higher total wins the contest and gets to resolve the knight action, and the other one doesn't. If there's a tie, like we have here, then the tied player who assigned the most cards to that slot wins. If there's still a tie, then the tied player with the most influence in their personal supply is the winner. And if there's still a tie, no one gets to resolve their orders in that space. If someone does win the contested space, they resolve that knight action as usual, and the other players that were there don't get anything. But those players who lost out on that contested space move any cards that they had committed to that area of their player board and put them back in their hand instead of putting them in the torpor stack, which will help them out later, as we'll see. And remember, Knight spaces are the only ones that can become contested. When other spaces have more than one token on it, they are each resolved one at a time in order from top to bottom. So that's how you resolve all of the various order spaces, many of which will require following the instructions on the various cards in those spaces. And with that in mind, there are just a couple of rules related to the card effects that I should go over with you. If an effect, like we see on the barber here, tells you to discard a victim from a city quarter, you add it to a common face-up victim discard pile. Some effects, like the one we see here on this very oddly named victim card, will tell you to draw a victim from the victim deck. Now, if that deck is empty, you instead shuffle any victims in the victim discard pile into a new deck. And if there's no discarded victims to create a new deck from, the action just does nothing but you still have to pay any costs for the action as normal. Sometimes an effect will tell you to gain victory points, which are represented by this coffin symbol, and if so, you collect those as tokens and set them in front of you. If an effect, like we see here on the Butcher, tells a player to discard a card from their hand, then they place that card not into a discard pile, but into their own torpor pile. And with those rules understood, you should now be able to resolve all of the spaces and cards that you find during the resolution phase. And once all of the orders have been fully resolved, it's time for the cleanup phase. Here you'll set the cards in your hand aside for a moment, and then pick up all the ones in your torpor pile. The important thing is that you keep these two sets of cards separate. You must now pay one blood for every card in your torpor that you want to keep for the next day. Just keep in mind, at the end of the cleanup phase, you can have at most 10 cards total in your hand. So don't pay for more than you're able to hang on to. Any you do pay for, let's say for a moment that I decide to pay for three of these, so let's say I pay three blood, those I'll add back into my hand. And any elders or bleeders you didn't pay for, you then put back in their related decks, and other types of victims that you didn't pay for, 
You then send to a common victim discard pile beside the board. After players have paid for any cards they had in their torpor that they want to keep, they should discard down to no more than 10 cards in their hand if they have more than 10. You now prepare for the next day by adding one blood and one influence from the general supply to the night space to the right of any dusk space that still contains a victim card. Any dusk space with no victim in it now has one drawn and added to it from the victim deck. Now anytime a new victim is added to a dusk space, the night space beside it should be emptied, if it isn't already, and then three blood and an amount of influence equal to the influence symbol on the new card here is added to the night box beside it, just like we did during the original setup. And like the setup, you also adjust the fear tracking die in that row to equal the number of fear symbols on the location and victim cards within that quarter. Next, move the day act tracking marker up one space. Each player now takes back their three order tokens from wherever they are, along with their screen in order to hide their player board once more. They also straighten any ritual cards they might have had rotated sideways to show that those can be used again in the next day. Finally, the player holding the start player marker now passes it to the player on their left, and a new day is ready to begin. When advancing the day act marker, if you cross into a new act, you'll have a couple of extra steps to follow in the cleanup phase. First, before doing anything else, remove all of the location and victim cards from the board and return them, as well as any that are in that act's victim draw and discard piles, back to the game box. Also empty all of the tokens that are currently located in the night spaces. Then find the next act's location and victim decks that we had set aside during the setup and deal out new locations from them, returning any of the extra locations back to the box, and deal out the required new victims, setting the rest of them as a deck nearby. Then, just like we did at the start of the game, you'll add three blood to each of the night spaces, and the influence to those spaces that matches the influence values shown on the victims in those rows. Also, adjust the fear dice as necessary to match the fear symbols found in each of the rows. Then remove the old ritual deck from the game and put the current axe deck into its place, but keep any of the old rituals in the face-up display except for the rightmost one, which you can also return to the box, sliding the remaining cards to the right and then drawing a new one from the new deck to set into the open space. And then you finish the rest of the cleanup phase as normal and begin a new day. At the end of the ninth day, you'll have completed the third act and the game ends. Just remember, even at the end of that final day, you'll still need to pay blood for any cards in your torpor that you want to add back to your hand. And you may want to do that because cards in your hand can be worth points, as we'll see. Speaking of which, let's see how players calculate their final scores. First, remember that this coffin symbol is the symbol for victory points. And you now gain the victory points showing in the top right corner of any cards in your hand. You also get the points showing on any ritual cards you collected and add the points of any victory point tokens you have. And then you get one more point for every two influence you have. So these five influence would be worth two points. Finally, check your position on the fear track and then add or subtract the points that are showing either at the space you're on or if there's no points showing there, the most recent space with scoring points that you've passed. So this blue token is worth five points, while the green player's token here is worth three points. The player with the most total points wins. Now, if there's a tie, the tied player with the most cards in their hand wins. If there's still a tie, the tied player with the most rituals wins. And if there's still a tie, the tied player with the most influence wins. And if there's still a tie, the tied players share the victory and rule the underworld together. But otherwise, that's everything you need to know to play Blood Orders. If you have any questions at all about anything you saw here, feel free to put them in the comments below and I'll gladly answer them as soon as I get a chance. You'll also find forums for discussion, pictures, other videos, and lots more over on the games page at Board Game Geek, and I'll put a link to that in the description below. And if you found this video helpful, please consider giving it a like, subscribing, and clicking that little bell icon so you get a notification anytime we post a new video. And if you'd like to support us directly, you can join our Patreon team, which I'll have linked below. But until next time, thanks for watching.